Okay, so uh, great to see you all here. Thank you everyone for coming. My name is Dr. Alexander Medcalf, and I'm the Deputy Director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Global Health Histories based here at York. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our seminar today on the local contexts and universal effects of air pollution. This seminar is part of a, uh, a new series for 2019, the Culture and Health webinar series, which seeks to draw together interdisciplinary panels uh, to examine the historical and the cultural context of current global health issues, to think through the different ways uh, that these can be addressed, and to use these discussions to help the global health community respond to present day challenges. The series overall will feature nine seminars, of which this is the second. The full listings are on the poster here, but also available online. Uh, and whilst these will be held at different venues, uh, Copenhagen, here in York and in Exeter, each one is going to be uh, live streamed uh, and recorded. So anyone who wants to tune in, uh, listen to presentations, take part, ask, pose questions to our uh, panellists, can do so through the Slido function, about which I'll explain a little bit more uh, in a couple of moments' time. Now, the webinars are a collaboration between the WHO Regional Office for Europe's Cultural Context of Health Project and two WHO collaborating centres, our centre here at York, also the Welcome Centre for Cultures, Environments and Health at the University of Exeter. And the series is funded and supported by the Welcome Trust. Now, those of you who have seen the local advertising will have seen that this is also number 119 in our Global Health Histories seminar series. Um, as, the, uh, as the numbering suggests, this is a very long-standing series indeed. Since 2004, it's centred on the idea that understanding the history of health, and particularly the last 60 years or so, can help the global public uh, health community respond to present-day challenges. And similar to the seminar series there, we also have a lot of events coming up here in York, but also venues around the world. Later on in March, we have a seminar on uh, smallpox. So do bookmark uh, this page as well and take a look, especially for the local audience, the seminars we've got coming up in York. But we also try and uh, live stream where possible and record these seminars too. So on to today's uh, session on air pollution. Um, this is, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware and you're all interested in this issue, a really pressing problem for uh, global health today. It's a major, air pollution poses a major risk to health, reducing life expectancy and lowering quality of life, and it's arguably an issue which affects everyone. We'll be using this seminar to um, examine the cultural drivers of increased air pollution, as well as state and community-based responses to the problem. Through the presentations, we'll be thinking through uh, air pollution, not just uh, vehicle emissions and kind of industrial emissions, but also the issues posed by indoor air pollution as well. And a key uh, point of consideration will be how to raise awareness about this and how to engage people and politicians on this topic. So I'm delighted to welcome today our pre presenters at the front of the room. Uh, Cressida and Mark, who are, oh sorry Cressida, <laughs> I'm keen to have you up here as well, <laughs> but uh, I just said a few more words, a few more words first. Um, and also Pierre Paolo, who in a first, I think, for this series will be joining us uh, via the screen at the front through the magic of technology. I'll fully introduce our speakers uh, in a moment, but we'll be hearing from each of them in turn, and then we'll leave plenty of time towards the final section of the seminar for questions and discussion, both in the room, but also uh, online as well. We have an online audience tuned in today, uh, and I'd like to encourage our, our online audience to pose their questions via the Slido function. We're going to be looking at these throughout the course of the seminar, looking at how the discussion is building up. Um, 
at kind of taking the temperature as the comments are voted up and then we'll use these and the questions from the room to structure our discussion for the final part of the seminar. So without further ado, I'd like to move on now to welcome our first presenter today, Dr. Cressida Boya, who is a Senior Research Fellow in Enterprise Innovation in the Faculty of Creative and Cultural Industries at the University of Portsmouth. A scientist by training, having previously worked in the music business, Cresta works across disciplines and applies creative methodologies to the development of health and well-being innovations. She's been involved in a number of research projects, including the development of biomaterials, wound dressings, and investigating alternative treatments uh, for antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And recently, she's been a core member of the AIR Network, a new partnership um, which brings together African and European researchers, practitioners and community members interested in air pollution in low resource settings in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's about this project which she's going to talk to us today. So over to you, Cresta. Thanks, Alex. Um, is it this one? Okay. Down. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome, and thanks a lot for coming along. Um, and thank you to Alex Megcalf and uh, Sanjoy Bhattacharya um, from the Centre for Global Health Histories. And thank you also to the World Health Organization European Regional Office for hosting this webinar. And um, as Alex mentioned, I'm going to tell you a little bit. It'll be a bit of a whistle-stop tour around the work of the AIR Network in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. So I just wanted to um, show this slide of the 17 um, sustainable development goals that were developed by the UN um, and um, set up in 2015. They're aimed basically at ending poverty, protecting the planet, and ensuring peace and prosperity for all, which is quite an ambition. Um, clean air isn't one of the headline goals, but it is mentioned in two targets. It's mentioned under um, SDG 3 and SDG 11 cities, um, and the World Health Organization monitors three SDGs in relation to air pollution, and that's health, cities, and clean energy. The World Health Organization estimates that nine out of 10 people breathe polluted air, and this results in seven million premature deaths every year. Uh, the main health risks associated with air pollution are respiratory and cardio cardiovascular disease, cancer and stroke. 90% of the deaths attributed to air pollution occur in low and middle income countries. Outdoor air pollution is caused mainly by burning of fossil fuels, principally for power heating um, and uh, transport. So in Western Europe and some parts of the Americas, Legislation and public awareness campaigns have been quite successful in reducing the emissions of particulate matter in the last few years, but this isn't the case in um, most of the countries in the world. Indoor air pollution occurs mainly as a result of traditional cooking methods. Open fires and cook stoves are used by almost three billion people on the planet to prepare their food and heat their homes. And the fuels that most people have access to are fairly poor quality, um, and indoor air pollution rates can be very high. So more than half of the deaths attributed to air pollution are as a result of indoor rather than outdoor exposures. So we've been working in Makuru, which is an in informal settlement to the east of Nairobi in Kenya. It's home to more than 100,000 households who live in these small shacks with uh, very limited access to even the most basic of resources. Water, electricity, toilet facilities are all, they're not, none of those services are provided in the home. 
There have been some efforts to reduce air pollution in this community. However, they haven't always been successful, but you have to remember that life in the slums is really not easy, and there are many daily challenges, and making a choice about air pollution and how you behave is just one of these. So, you know, if you're given a choice of cooking your food and creating air pollution or not feeding your children, it isn't really a choice. Whoops. So why, why do so many of the current efforts fail to make an impact? Perhaps we should think about including local communities more in the research we do and the decisions we make about how we're going to tackle air pollution in these communities. So that's the point of the air network. Um, we wanted to identify how best to involve local people in making solutions. We're a multidisciplinary team made up of African and European researchers and local community members. Um, we really wanted to find out if co-creating Makuru-led initiatives to tackle air pollution would result in more workable and more culturally, re culturally relevant solutions that are therefore more likely to succeed. So we started, we had a week-long workshop in Makuru where we, taught, we discussed people's daily experience of air pollution, we discussed how the community definitions of air pollution are different from the scientific definitions of air pollution, and we talked about who might be responsible for making improvements. We explored a number of techniques, including participatory mapping, storytelling, games, theatre, music, film and photography as research tools. And we wanted to break down the barriers between the academics and the community members. We wanted to go beyond previous top-down initiatives and tackle exposure in a completely different way. So we quickly realised that using creative methodologies that opened up communication between academics and the community and was more inclusive and certainly more fun than using traditional questionnaires or running focus groups. Uh, this is um, Jana being a cook stove and Googie as a stroppy landlord complaining to his tenant about uh, her use of cook stoves. And this is how we use these theatre pieces to explore different experiences in the community. Um, we used, during the following months, we set out to document the community viewpoints and create outputs for raising awareness, for data gathering, for public dissemination and engagement. And these are two Makuru artists creating a map of the local area. Uh, which we then took out into, well, they took it out into the local community. We, we'd sort of abandoned them at this point and let them get on with it. Um, and people identified local hot pollution hotspots and also um, sources of that pollution. We created stories, theatre pieces, music, mural and film. Um, and this is a picture of the Makuri Kings, who composed a song especially for us, which is called Mazingira, which means environment in Swahili. And you can find that on YouTube, or you can come and visit the exhibition after this talk and hear it. So in September last year, we held an arts festival, basically to celebrate the work of the network and to uh, showcase all our outputs. It was a fantastic day. It was a great success, and we had about 1,500 people from the local community attending. So we came into this community with preconceptions about the main causes of air pollution. By giving the community space to contribute to the research, we uncovered other perspectives. Burning waste, poor sanitation, unregulated industrial emissions, 
unregulated working conditions, fires, a lack of firefighting equipment. Fires are quite common because to get electricity, people kind of hook, hook onto the pylons and that's incredibly dangerous. These were all cited as significant sources of air pollution that were kind of surprising to us, although of course not at all surprising to the community. So the, we really, we discovered that actually <laughs> practically all, if not all, of the development goals play a role in air pollution. And we'll need to sort of develop co-solutions to all these problems if we're really going to tackle the problem. Um, the Makurum community is a marginalised com community. The residents have few rights or regulations and very limited access to basic resources. Air pollution is part of a much bigger picture that's related to social and economic inequalities. In Western Europe, it's quite easy to consider the problem of air pollution as separate from, say, hunger. But in a community like Makuru, they're very much intertwined. Life in Makuru is really tough, but this is a really youthful community that's hugely self-motivated, bursting with talent, energy and activism, and really keen to be heard and really keen to be involved and become part of the solution. In fact, they need to be part of the solution if we're going to have a workable solution. So these are the, uh, it was a multi-partner team of, of the Air Network. Uh, these are all the partners. And there's a link to our website. So thank you for listening and mostly thanks to the people of Makuru for making us incredibly welcome in the community. Um, we're really happy because we've got some more funding to carry on our work out there. And uh, I'll be going back in May to uh, continue using creative methods to collect scientific data. Thank you very much, you. Cressida. Um, and uh, as, uh, as Cressida says, there's across the hall, we have an exhibition uh, in featuring a lot more of those photos uh, and some of the, the digital stories and things. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to invite you all to join us over there uh, where myself, Cresta, and uh, perhaps a few others will be talking through a few of the things that we've got going on. It's just across the, the hall in the exhibition space. But uh, I'm going to do something now I've always wanted to do and say we're going live now to Bonn. <laughs> um, for our, our second presentation of this afternoon, um, by Pierre Paolo Moudou, Dr. Pierre Paolo Moudou. Yeah, he's a statistician, easy for me to say, statistician, <laughs> geographer and geographer who has worked for 10 years at the WHO's environment, European Environment and Health Centre in Rome, eight years in the Bonn European Environment and Health Centre, and for one year at the WHO headquarters in Geneva. Most recently, he's been coordinating uh, AirQ Plus, the software that calculates the impacts of air pollution and health and has been involved in several impact assessments of environmental policy interventions in various countries and cities as well as the development of case studies in Accra, Kathmandu for the, uh, and Kathmandu for the Urban Health Initiative. He's also coordinating the development of a QGIS plugin or Green UR for the assessment of the impacts of green spaces on health. So with that I'd like to hand over now to Pierre Paolo. Um, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the organizers. I think this is a good chance to have a um, discussion on some themes and topics that are that have been neglected for many years. Although there's a large literature on uh, on cultural uh, and social change and uh, communication and air pollution, but um, we are. Now in a different framework, um, the last years uh, have been uh, uh, facing uh, a real uh, revolution in, uh, in communication. 
Um, I will take advantage of, um, of this presentation basically to introduce more questions than uh, describing case studies or giving answers. Um, I will introduce questions because these are uh, the questions that we have to face at WHO um, daily. Uh, so this is our daily bread. And uh, these questions obviously are different from the questions that were uh, in the past. But they are all related to the fact that we need to uh, have a new strategies for um, communicating uh, the air pollution uh, risk. So I have very few slides because I, I think it would be very interesting uh, to have a, um, a discussion with the people in the audience and the people that are connected. My main points of, of discussion now are on the importance of risk communication uh, this for air pollution health impacts and health effects. Then how we see the evolution of the social framework that is now surrounding risk communication. I will show a couple of slides on ongoing uh, WHO activities and I will give uh, some suggestions for, uh, for the discussion. So the importance of risk communication of air pollution effects, this is quite, um, I would say, trivial in the sense that it's been codified, has been discussed and uh, uh, agreed. Um, during along the years, the fact that we need to have clear goals uh, when we communicate. We need to distinguish uh, our target audiences. We need to have a, a clear selection of the type of information messages that we want to um, convey. And then we need to choose uh, our media, uh, the vehicle that uh, our message will be uh, using to, uh, to be delivered. So this is uh, trivial, but let, let's start from the, the simple, even trivial, but I mean everything uh, that I've said can be obviously uh, challenged and discussed. Um, what is happening uh, now, um, I think in, uh, in our field is the fact that um, we do not just want to give information about air pollution uh, levels of the impacts of air pollution, but we try to have a, a, a policy where uh, there are some interventions, or there are changes in behavior uh, toward a an healthier and, uh, and better well-being situation for uh, different social groups. Um, I am quoting here um, a paper by Oltrain Sala that was published a few years ago about a study about the, uh, the way communi air pollution communication is uh, happening in, in Spain. It's quite interesting paper. Um, but what is interesting, and I think it's part of the, our daily work, as I was mentioning before, is the fact that we are trying to understand much, uh, much more in detail than before uh, how air pollution information is available to the public. So what is the, really the, the social construction of air pollution information available to people? And this is obviously something that is different in the different locations, the different places where we are working, and it has different uh, scalar implication. Um, I have put together uh, something of, uh, um, of the new, uh, I would say, the new framework of uh, communicate of risk communication. Um, this is uh, <coughs> something that we experience now, of, at least since a, a decade is the fact that we have infotainment uh, that has been the way um, science and, uh, uh, and the way most of the news are, uh, are built. So there are information and there is entertainment at the same time. This is one of the things that we, we can uh, check. I mean, every, if we go on TV, it, that's uh, clear. Um, there's been, and this is a revolution also, I think, in the education expertise. Uh, most of you are in the university there. And uh, if we compare, the, I think, the university structure of 30 years ago, even if it looks similar in the organigram, the fact that it's um, the education, the precariousness of, uh, of jobs, the fact that we have a lot of adjunct professor, the fact that we have uh, expertise that now is built also outside university in a way or another, uh, this, is, this has been a big change. And this, um, this big change has been accompanied by the fact that people, uh, for any kind of topics and subject, they can Google um, 
they can Google it. So they and this is what they do. They have an easy access to uh, any kind of information. Uh, but this has also uh, been associated uh, in the last decade with a significant increase in public mistrust of science and uh, expertise and experts. This is, um, I think, one of the major uh, challenges that we have uh, currently. And this is associated, uh, the, the increase in public mistrust does not come alone. It comes also with the fact that, I was saying before, we can Google all our uh, uh, curiosity, all our needs of information, and we can also have a confirmation bias. So if I think that the earth is flat, I can Google Earth flat and I can find um, a scientific, a pseudo-scientific institution uh, that is saying, well, look, we have scientists that can demonstrate that the Earth is flat. Or, well, I can Google the fact that vaccination is bad for, for the population and I can find a lot of groups. And we can have this confirmation bias um, that is going on and on. And, and this is a, an incredible practice of interpreting, uh, I think, our, um, our data in our knowledge. Um, on top of this, I think that we, we have um, a huge development of so-called pseudoscience and conspiracy uh, thinking. Uh, well, you know uh, many examples on, on this. And on the other hand, we have something that is quite in, uh, important, and I will spend probably a minute on this, is the diffusion of uh, so-called citizen science practices. So what we can do, um, I had, out of all these uh, points, I have just decided to uh, open more discussion on citizen science because I uh, find that uh, um, in order to address some of the uh, big practices that are going on, 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 for example, confirmation bias and mistrust in expertise, in experts in science, uh, citizen science can offer um, some kind of support to the work that we are doing to promote public health. Um, citizen science is not a, um, a novelty. I mean, so the, um, the expression citizen science, I think it was recorded in the Oxford English, English Dictionary in 2014. It is a practice that in, uh, has been going on for 100 years, but with different names. Um, there, so, we don't have, a, I would say, a strict definition for uh, what is citizen science. We can discuss uh, also on this, on how to define citizen science. But what is important is that um, we have a lot of questions about how far can citizen science go in producing so-called good science. And then the other point is that which are the boundaries that we have between citizens and experts at the moment? Um, then if we go on with the questions more related to air pollution, this is the work I do, is um, how does air pollution become an object of political dispute? This is quite important to understand why uh, we have communities where we have a, a huge conflict that is centered ar around air pollution and then living in uh, uh, polluted areas or, or less polluted areas than other communities where we have uh, uh, less of a political dispute. This is something that is quite interesting to discuss. The other point is that what is the main interest on air pollution that we have, uh, um, that we find among the public? Uh, so the people are interested in their individual exposure or the community exposure, and this is a, not a, um, a simple uh, question and it's not easy to answer uh, to this, and you have to see uh, case by case. And then uh, I would say this is the, the last question is quite important for uh, WHO, but also for many other people working in air pollution is that uh, the fact that there's, um, if you consider, is if we have an air pollution knowledge gap, and if you are in in New York and if you are in England, I would say that there is no air pollution knowledge gap in the sense that um, you have all the data that you want for air pollution. You have real-time real -time data, you have satellite data constantly monitoring where you are. Probably, yeah, at the individual level you can get better data, but uh, there's no air pollution knowledge gap. Uh, the situation is quite different than the case before uh, mentioned in Nairobi, where um, we <coughs> don't have um, a system of uh, air pollution monitoring that is 
I would say comparable to anything that we have in uh, in, uh, in uh, European Union. Um, citizen science has been, uh, as it was mentioned before, uh, has been a way in which people have been uh, uh, locating the hotspots. They have been locating uh, the place where they live. So they have been building a participatory um, movement, a participatory pattern uh, to change the, uh, the policies and to do policy making. I came here with um, just the most um, authoritative uh, kind of institutions, uh, among the most authoritative, so the US EPA and the European uh, Commission, that they have both programs on, uh, on citizen science. Um, I have brought with me a, um, a very recent uh, um, project that has this been going in the Flanders, in the, the north of Belgium, where there are 20,000 citizens that are measuring uh, air quality, okay, NO2, uh, close to their, um, where they live. And this is one, it's the largest example that I know um, of uh, citizen science. Just to give you an, an, an idea of uh, something that we can discuss later, because obviously this kind of project cannot be reproduced in places where the levels of air pollution are much, much higher. Uh, but we have, we have to discuss, I think, on these disparities on, uh, on the global level. The actual activities, I would say, that are um, related to... Yes? Yeah, yeah, I will, I'm going straight to the conclusions. Um, we have... A, a, on, uh, on communication, we have... A, I, we have three different activities. One is on, on uh, uh, raising awareness, and it was mentioned before. The other one is on how to communicate expert knowledge. And then the third one is how to make recommendations, for example, on, on interventions. Uh, I brought here a slide where we have uh, um, some of the most common work um, uh, that we uh, people know. It's on our websites on air pollution, where we have data collection, we have information on uh, uh, health effects, and we have frequently asked questions. We have a raise awareness campaign that is called Breathe Life, that has been a global campaign for clean air. And uh, what we are doing recently is we are going and analyzing what is available, for example, in YouTube on, on air pollution, and we are trying to see uh, what kind of information, how many views, and what kind of uh, debate is in uh, um, is available to uh, uh, to a media that is watched by uh, I see if I'm not wrong two billion people a, a month, and then we have started interviewing experts on air pollution and uh, health impacts to create um, a different way to uh, uh, I would say to put closer uh, expertise to uh, to the population. So this is my last slides and. Uh, um, Three of the questions that you see, they were discussed two weeks ago with an expert meeting in Geneva, the quarter, about uh, um, the how we have to, uh, to work on the, on the perception uh, that we have in different places and the responsibility that people put at individual level or at the state level or the regional level uh, of all the authorities. This was the, main, the first question. Then, uh, how we can see different uh, air pollution risk perception in different cultures and areas of the world. Then, how we should uh, adapt our risk communication, uh, reflecting the different ways that people are um, perceiving their responsibility con concerning air pollution. Think about uh, putting, uh, for example, face masks. Um, and then the fourth point is on how to, we can build and rebuild public trust in expert knowledge. I think these are um, the questions that we are dealing at the moment um, in the show, among many others, on, uh, uh, to, uh, to promote public health uh, and to uh, tackle uh, air pollution. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre Paolo. And yeah, the reason we're, we're having the short, kind of punchy uh, presentations today is so we have enough time to discuss these really interesting questions which are being uh, raised through the presentations this afternoon. So we now move on to uh, MR Press, that's the one, our final presentation of this afternoon. 
Dr. Mark Reacher, who, uh, who, did his UK, who did his UK public health training in the east of England from 1992 to 96, following five years at John Hopkins School of Public Health and the Wilmer Eye Institute. Mark's also worked on malaria, trachoma, and prevention of blindness in Thailand, Oman, and Tanzania. He's now a consultant epidemiologist with Public Health England and an affiliated lecturer in the Department of Public Health and Primary Care at the University of Cambridge. He's a board member of the PHE Centre for Radiation Chemicals and Environment, CRCE, and his environmental interests include air pollution, climate change, health impacts of flooding, and waterborne and foodborne infections. Great to have you with us today, Mark. Please take it away. Uh, right. The PowerPoint clicker. Oh, great. I've got a clicker, so I'm bound yeah. to go backwards instead of forwards. Does this have a pointer as well? It does. If you press yeah. the laser, just don't point it at me. At <laughs> uh, the bottom one. Oh, that's the one with the button mark death ray. Is it good? Yes. Okay, that's nice to know. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to uh, come and participate in this seminar. Um, I was asked whether I would present to you some of our experience in the east of England. So here we've got a, an environment which is very, very privileged, very, very affluent. Uh, and ours is a model of where we go with air pollution in uh, a mature industrialized uh, economy. Um, but I believe that, in fact, there is a, a series of fundamental opportunities which are deliverable worldwide. Now then, so far I'm, I'm so good, I'll try and use the, the, the bar instead. So um, we've had an overview of some of the many WHO um, comments about uh, and analyses about uh, ambient air pollution. Um, and these are probably conservative estimates, attributable 3 million deaths annually, um, impacts on all areas of the world. Uh, Western Pacific and Southeast Asia are particularly badly affected. Um, about 90% of the world um, are currently being exposed at times or continually to uh, air, which does not meet WHO quality guidelines. And you might say, well, maybe the guidelines are a pitch too high. Um, there's a rapidly expanding understanding of the importance of air pollution uh, in terms of uh, producing severe burden of disease. And that's already been mentioned by Cressida. These are principally to do with cancers um, and to do with cardiovascular disease and recognition, of course, of fetal damage. And this is not so surprising, given the level of air pollution and the fact that we have to breathe in order to stay alive. Um, I was asked, to, could we do something in the east of England? So I, I went off and had a quick look at what the United Kingdom, and particularly English, government guidance um, existed on... Um, air pollution mitigation. Uh, in actual fact, there's a plethora of guidance. And, and by reviewing it all, uh, I was able to uh, appreciate it into eight um, principal areas um, and to attempt then to uh, take those areas, to turn them into a questionnaire, and then to ask the engagement of our local government uh, offices within the east of England, uh, all of whom, par one, and participated in these two surveys, completed these questionnaires, and I'm going to give you a precy of what they showed in a few minutes. And following each of these, we fed back the results of the surveys to uh, all of these officers um, to try to build a consensus and share good practice. So this is um, a little bit from the south of here. These are the local authorities in the east of England. And in 2017, we got... Uh, a 95% response rate from lower tier, 100% response rate from unitary authorities. These are uh, big cities which have both of these functions, such as Peterborough um, and uh, Luton, uh, and then upper tier local authorities. So almost all of the local authorities bought in and completed the survey. And these are some of the sort of key results that we got from one or both years. Um, almost... Um, um, a number of them had actually zero um, air quality monitoring uh, action plans, which is against what uh, national guidance was. Um, there are a lot of these action plans on air quality were between seven and ten years out of date. Um, in terms of air quality monitoring, um, there were in fact a, a few 
um, which were able to do real-time uh, monitoring and to make it available to the public. Um, all uh, monitored uh, nitrogen dioxide, but the proportion of other um, pollutants um, in the local authorities are much lower um, as a proportion of the total, particularly PM2.5, which is now, along with nitrogen dioxide, um, meant to be the most discerning of all of the measures of ambient air pollution. Um, we asked them about to what degree they were able to involve uh, the public that they served in terms of collaborative working and public engagement meetings, and um, there were about 24% um, who had actually been able to discuss uh, the results of ambient air quality at public meetings for their population. So not a very high and complete takeoff of that. We looked at their arrangements for environmental change and planning. Almost all local authorities said that um, their input um, with respect to air pollution was largely ignored in planning applications and that there is a complete uh, separation between uh, town planners and people who are actually trying to look at the quality of air in the plans which are being produced. There was some um, traffic management, enforcement of financial incentives. Um, so there have been um, some council uh, attempts to uh, run uh, recharging points for electric vehicles, um, some small amount of, uh, of effort in those directions, but generally um, not a very uh, complete picture at all. Um, initiatives providing environment education and healthier travel. Um, there are some policies in place there and practice, but by and large, um, trying to promote active travel uh, is still an uphill battle. And then some authorities had also taken on the issue of uh, issuing alerts to people who are ill with cardiovascular disease, uh, COPD, and acute asthma, and giving them uh, rag warnings either by online methods or by apps. But uh, at the moment, the, uh, the number of local authorities doing, giving real-time uh, instruction by health apps is a minority. So that was our... Um, that is the results of our survey, and we're ongoing and, and getting people to share their experience. But um, because I was asked to uh, give some kind of treatment about culture and behaviour, I'd just like to think to myself, well, what have I learned from this? So I would say there are some really fundamental things that we're up against here. I mean, what, what are the determinants of local and general atmospheric health? And by that I mean local outdoor air quality, indoor air quality, and of course I actually mean global warming as well. These are all being lived out in slightly different timescales. What I'd say is, um, think of the likes of early man emerging um, from the Rift Valley. Uh, these hominids who then cross the Sinai Peninsula uh, uh, are out to the rest of the earth or stayed within the African continent. We are all descended um, from these people. What did they like? They liked energy to improve life. They made fire. That's a distinctive feature of humankind, according to most anthropologists. Many of them uh, were migrants. They liked to travel. Um, in terms of hunting, trapping, and fishing, um, they were selected to like technology. In terms of being able to hunt, they had to be able to run. They had to be able to hunt. Um, some of them in horses, uh, along with camels. Um, they like pleasure. They like to rock and roll. Human beings want pleasure. They want rock and roll. And there is, of course, also sex and drugs, which go either end of those. I don't want to get into those, apart from sex, because drugs is too contentious. But undoubtedly, population uh, growth is a tremendous problem. And the invention of effective contraception in 1959 gave mankind a crucial new technology that is feasible without destroying pleasure to actually contain a population and to use sex in a way which is not going to undermine all of this. And then early farmers um, who settled did their bit for the green environment. They might have actually enjoyed the green environment. So I would say those are what early men liked. What about modern man today? What do we like? We like energy to improve life. We like to travel. 
Um, we like technology, but now we have machines as well as hunting and trapping. Um, we love speed and convenience, and the automobile, um, rather than um, capitalism and money, is the opium of the masses. We are completely psychologically and physically dependent on automobiles. We still love rock and roll and racing. Um, we have become detached from the earth and from agriculture because of industrial food production. And um, nonetheless, there is still uh, a residual echo for a desire for an appreciation of the outdoor environment. And what about the likes of future man? If we survive at all uh, through the current ecological cataclysm, I would say that um, we will go on liking energy, but we actually now have the technology to make that energy renewably for the first time ever. And these technologies in terms of uh, renewable power sources and particularly the information systems that can integrate um, uh, uh, modern grids and create locally generated electricity are transformative and they've become available in the last five years. We're still going to want to travel, but it's got to be done with renewable energy. We're still going to love technology, but there is ample opportunity for these technologies to sustain sustainability in the future. We're never going to give up um, the speed and convenience of automobiles. If you tackle a country and say you cannot drive, you must not drive, we're going to raise fuel taxes, you get the, what's known as the gilet jaune response uh, in France, which is all about a threat to take away automobiles. It's a, no, it's a non-starter, or to limit them. We're still going to want rock and roll for pleasure, and we're still going to want to do something with the earth. I would suggest that we have to really re-engage um, with the earth. Uh, uh, we've got these educational uh, uh, challenges, we've got to continue uh, to make attractive, um, sustainable uh, recreation. And what underpins all of this, um, I would say to you that Jung, um, in 1916, first wrote about his, content, uh, his concept of the collective unconscious. Uh, Jung, of course, was a preeminent psychoanalyst uh, and wrote a great deal on this. And one of his sentences was, the collective unconscious um, comprises in itself the psychic life of our ancestors right back to the earliest beginnings. So that's why I have uh, laboured those earlier points. There's one other thing which I think we should remember in trying to tackle all of this, is what I would call the Rubik hydrocarbon engines. Uh, and by this I mean that hydrocarbons are almost completely perfect fuels if you discount um, the environmental pollution and greenhouse gas emissions that they make. They are hugely energy dense, they have an incredibly high energy to weight ratio. They're relatively easy to transport, store, process, and distribute, particularly oil. Coal, of course, um, fell slightly out of fashion. We understand how to make hydrocarbon engines. They're powerful, they're speedy, they're incredibly flexible. Um, the other thing is that uh, empowering and directing energy, particularly in transport systems using hydrocarbons, requires minimal societal cooperation. So it, it, it highly appeals the highly individualistic evolution of society, which is the direction we're moving in. All renewables, uh, by and large, are going to require return to much higher levels of societal integration and responsibility. And that's a real impediment. And the most important thing of all, I would say, is that hydrocarbons and their engines hugely concentrate wealth. So the automotive and uh, fossil fuel industries um, are important because they attract enormous quantities of wealth and they influence and dominate all policy and all technology. And this is a huge problem we have to see through. We have to empower people to question this. All of the sustainable energy solutions do not offer that concentration of wealth and they are deeply unattractive for the people who currently own oil companies coal companies and automotive industries. So these are the impediments to uh, future progress uh, for in the long term sorting out the problem of air pollution. In a highly industrialised country like ours, in a highly industrialised area like the east of England, we actually have the technologies now to get on top of this. It's not a matter of ca can it be done. It can be done. Um, there's a, it requires leadership 
and political will and moving rapidly with the new technologies that we now have. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Anna, could you pull two chairs around? And could I invite our, our two speakers in the room to switch on your mics uh, and join me at the front for the discussion? Um, now, as I said at the top of the seminar, uh, uh, and we also have uh, Pierre Paolo, I think, still joining us on the discussion. Yes, yeah, we can. Thank you very much. Yes, we can. We can hear you loud and clear. Um, what I'd like to do, though, is uh, perhaps switch between the two. We have the room for a bit longer, but our online audience uh, only has the hour or so. So, if you'll indulge me, perhaps we could have a look at what's been going on on Slido uh, in terms of the questions. Can we have access to the slides after the webinar? You certainly can. It's being recorded. But if we pop downwards uh, a little way, um, perhaps uh, if there's... Oh, can everyone see those clearly enough on the board? Yes. Um, perhaps we could start uh, with this question about how... Um, do community and scientific definitions of air pollution differ? Uh, would you, uh, anyone be prepared to, uh, to yeah, tackle that I can, one? I can talk about a little okay. bit about what we found. So the scientific definitions of air pollution tend to be around particulate matter 2.5 and 10 in particular, nitrous um, oxide, sulfur dioxide, volatile organic compounds, but actually, what we discovered in Makuru was what people cited as the main sources of air pollution in their community was um, bad smells from the fact that there's no sanitation, basically. I mean, there's open drainage, it's open sewers. And some people might say, well, hang on a minute, you know, how can bad smells be air pollution? But actually, they are air pollution for those people. And actually, they are air pollution in, the, in terms of the fact that there are molecules entering the atmosphere that are damaging to health. Um, similarly, with the burning of plastic waste, which is pretty much ubiquitous across the whole community, and you're, you know, there's this horrible sort of pool of like plastic burning that hangs around, and that, you know, the, the um, that releases dioxins and furans, which are incredibly damaging to human health. And again, they're not traditionally associated with air pollution. Firefighting, I briefly mentioned, so you get fires because the um, way people access electricity is quite hazardous. And then if, there, if a fire does break out, the firefighting equipment can't pass through the tiny little alleyways in the community. There's no water, you know, there's this whole sort of multiple effects that we really don't, and they're not sources of air pollution in the UK. So we wouldn't necessarily recognise them. And that's why it's so important to involve communities in thrashing out solutions um, and actually using methods of communication that are democratic, I suppose. Yeah. Um, Mark or, or Pierre Paolo, do you have any, any comments on, well, well, on this? Well, I would say, by and large, I think that the um, perception of the community uh, uh, and um, actual measurements and scientific consensus are really quite concordant. Um, I, I don't think there's a huge disparity there. Uh, I think um, science is probably showing us that the level of risk is actually far, far greater and the level of pollution is far higher uh, and the problem is worse than the, the public generally perceive. And to that degree, it's a slight inverse of many other hazards where it's more normally the case that public perception um, is uh, excessive, and, and whereas the risk assessment is somewhat lower. So it's quite at the opposite end of the, 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 equi the equilibrium to uh, nuclear power, for example, where there's a vast amount of, of a very clear public anxiety, but relatively modest, uh, genuine risk. We could debate that. I wouldn't try and force a view on anyone. So I think we're at the opposite end here. We, we know now more and more the, the level of ambient air pollution is terribly, terribly dangerous. And the general public 
are only just beginning to wake up to this. Thank you. Um, Pierre Paolo, any, any thoughts on, on that one? Yeah, um, I think um, this is an important question. Um, what, what's happening is that uh, um, from, from our experts, uh, people working in uh, social psychology, they, they've been giving us um, a clear message that uh, people tend to neglect uh, environmental hazards that cannot be directly perceived or sensed. Mm -hmm. So what Cressida was before mentioning the fact that people are uh, complaining because of the smell, this is something that uh, comes out of um, many, many studies. And uh, this is an issue uh, because air pollution is an invisible killer and in, it's very rarely in very few events, in very few occasions, uh, you can perceive um, air pollution. Um, this is, uh, I think, one of the main uh, discussions that you have with, uh, with people and uh, in many places about the, the levels of air pollution, because people think that exactly, if, there's, if they can smell it or if they can see some smog, that's the level that I feel uh, disturbed. And there are many studies in which they have been trying to, um, to compare the perception, the self-perception of air pollution and the levels of air pollution. And so far, as far as I know, they are inconclusive in uh, uh, raising evidence that um, the, our nose and our eyes are able to, to monitor uh, air pollution. And air pollution is a, is a weird, uh, is a wild animal because it's, a, it's not a substance, but it's a mixture of substances. And, um, and I go to the other point, I think it is important in the definitions that uh, you have to be aware of the fact that people, when they talk about what is the air pollution in their place, they also usually mention the sources. And this is very, very important. Uh, probably it's even more important than uh, people perceiving air pollution, but it's important when they start discussing what are the sources. Uh, so if it is transport, if it is uh, burning um, because of cooking or heating, uh, or if it is, I don't know, um, uh, um, the, the, the industrial activities. So there are uh, various uh, um, uh, definitions that are um, at stake uh, when, uh, when, when you are on the field. Uh, I think this is important to, uh, to take note. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. Certainly industrial emissions are a really significant source of air pollution in Makuru. And there are certain streets, you know, you walk up one particular street and immediately, you know, your eyes start really hurting and your throat sore and your nose is sore. But it's so normal and everyday for the people who live there that they, one of the quotes I think from the project was that the abnormal has become normal to us. Super, thank you. Um, any questions from our, our audience? Yes, please. How's that been, a mapping access, a microphone? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. If you could wait for the microphone. Thank you very much. Sorry, Hugh Ward. Um, has there been a mapping exercise to indicate the economic cost of pollution on the local and national level? So if pollution costs an amount of money on the public purse because it induces ill health, which costs money in the National Health Service or the Health Service, has there been any mapping exercise to indicate the total cost? Uh, yeah, the Department of Health conducted uh, um, exactly that exercise um, last year uh, and um, used the standard set of um, uh, models using disability adjusted life years. And these have now been uh, ma made available to local authorities um, on the fingertips tool. So if you um, go into Google uh, search uh, and go into fingertips, uh, you will actually be able to obtain uh, a health economic analysis by um, the geography of the United Kingdom. Um, you can debate uh, the legitimacy and verity of a, a, a health economic modelling, uh, but it has been done and it's they're very ambitious and it fulfils uh, uh, exactly the point that you're, you're raising. You can, you can actually calculate this on a geographic basis. Why is it that the majority of the electorate? Why is it that the majority of the electorate seem disconnected with the issue? And perhaps it is because no one's 
no one's actually connected them to the issue properly. They just talk at them. And I think Cressida's work to try and engage the community so they understand uh, in a language that they do understand and allows them to communicate with science in a different way. Otherwise, you're beholden to the media in the way that the media then transmits the scientific mm. evidence, mm. which might be a little uh, bias. Also, can I just add that, you know, pollution monitoring is really variable across the world. So we've got, I think, three air pollution monitoring stations in York. In Nairobi, there's one, and it's usually broken. Um, so those maps that have that data on them, it, they're really quite incomplete data sets. So it becomes quite difficult to accurately map the economic impact against the air pollution levels. Uh, Pierre Paolo, any further comments on that one, or shall we move, move yeah, on? We can switch it back um, to you if you like. Yeah. The, the economic impacts of air pollution has been studied um, with a kind of usual uh, econometric models with a value of, um, of statistical life or um, the value of life years. But in most recent years, also in, uh, in Africa, there's a a huge uh, effort to make measurements of the real cost of air pollution, the, the, the money that people spend to go to the hospitals because of cardiovascular disease, uh, the money that people have to spend to, um, to buy uh, medicines. So there's, I think, an evolving field of, of, of study that will give probably more uh, Estimate, estimates that will be closer to, to people than just to say uh, something like, oh, the, the value of um, uh, the cost for, the, for England of, uh, of all their pollution is, I don't know, a billion uh, pounds, and nobody cares about a billion pounds. But if you say that look, air pollution is provoking something like 300 pounds um, a year uh, in your family, that's something mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. maybe understand mm -hmm. better. Um, I, there are a few questions for the room, but I, I'm conscious we have to wrap up the webinar quite swiftly. So perhaps one more question from them online, and then we'll continue <laughs> the portion in the room. I wonder if I could ask our speakers, how aware do you think health policymakers are of the role of culture in air pollution? I know we've, we've kind of touched in and around this uh, already today, but any further thoughts from any of our presenters on, on that one? I think it's becoming more recognised now that the community mm -hmm. need to be included in responses to air pollution. Um, I think there's still a massive dislocate because it's quite annoying and quite difficult to have to take those things into account. It's much easier to like talk at people than listen to them. Um, so yeah, let's try and keep moving in the right direction. Yeah, I, I don't know whether... Um it's a good question. I think that um, because the impacts are so universal, um, that probably the, the harms uh, of air pollution are not uh, experienced hugely differently between different cultural groups, uh, I think. Um, so I, I think that some progress towards this um, mitigation um, is something which can transcend uh, cultural differences and actually build um, a shared cultural uh, goal. Um, certainly, um, if you want to link culture to disadvantage, economic and social disadvantage, there are great links there. Uh, and, of course, there's a huge sociological literature on, on this, so that in... Britain and other northern European countries, it's always been the case that the wealthy have lived on the west side of cities where mm -hmm. they receive fresh uh, ambient or diluted air, and the poor have always been uh, s located on the east side where the sort of wastelands of industry have accumulated. Um, so there will um, be strong relations between um, cultural subgroups, certainly in the UK, and exposure to air pollution. But I think it's driven not a priori by cultural differences, but as a product of relative um, socioeconomic advantage and disadvantage. Pierre Paolo, would you like to come in on that one? 
Very quickly, um, I think it's very difficult to generalize about the, um, the cultural, uh, I would say, uh, consciousness of uh, policymakers in air pollution. Mm -hmm. um, something that has happened in the, in the most recent years is the fact that in many countries, uh, the mayors of cities and now are the, the main uh, focal point for health and air pollution. So there's been a shift from uh, national government, regional authorities to, um, to the, at, at the city level, at the urban level. This has been uh, quite strong, and, and if you see, I mean, at the global level, so I'm trying to generalize a little, but there's a strong movement of mayors uh, that are advocating for better air. The other thing that is um, quite important uh, um, is the fact that air pollution is not just a local issue, but can be transboundary. So the, um, I would say that in the last decades, in some part of the world, there's been a, a real uh, consciousness about the fact that air pollution cannot be decreasing one place if other places close, other countries do not do the same. And in Europe and North America and are an example where transboundary air pollution has been uh, decreased um, tremendously. But I, I, I think now we have a revolution with, um, with all the social media and the, the way also the policy makers are, are formed. And the last point that I want to do is quite negative in the sense that um, as in the past we have had and we have still climate change denials, now we have also air pollution effects, uh, denials, and, uh, and this is quite uh, um, a, a change in, uh, also for, uh, in policy making. Super. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few more questions on there, but I think what I'd be tempted to do is have these, put these to our, our presenters and, and post them with the recording of this event to have them answered at a later date. Because I think at that point we have to end the webinar there. So we'll say goodbye to our online audience, but as I said, we have the room for a bit longer if we could take questions from the room itself. You've been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Um, so I have two very quick